So as some people may be aware, in recent months, uh, Nuwabians, or what's left of them, are trying to get their leader, uh, Dwight York, aka Malachi York, out of jail. Uh, now, for those who don't know, uh, Nuwabians are a black supremacist cult who, uh, from the 1970s roughly, who started out as Muslims, converted to Jews, converted to Christians, and pretended they were Native Americans. They also pretended they were aliens. Uh, they pretended they were Egyptologists. It's, a, it's one of the weirdest cults in uh, American history, probably. And uh, what's interesting about this is that he was convicted of um, multiple counts of child rape and is currently serving 135 years in federal prison. So let me play a, a clip of his current lawyer uh, discussing their attempts at getting him out of jail. For instance, my client, Malachi York, was sentenced to 135 years in a federal prison with no possibility of parole for nonviolent offenses. He had no significant criminal history prior to being arrested. And when he got into the justice system and he was on trial, there was no physical evidence, no DNA evidence, and he was sentenced to an unthinkable amount of time in prison. Now, this is what I want to talk about because everything this lawyer has just said is a lie. Now, concerning the quote-unquote nonviolent offenses, one of the things that these guys like to do is that they like to uh, play fast and loose with the facts. Uh, one of the things they like to ignore is that there was a state case and there was a federal case. In the federal case, which is uh, the one where he got 135 years, yes, in theory, you could argue that these were nonviolent offenses because if you look at the charges, it was transporting minors, which might be uh, nonviolent, uh, except if you ignore the that he was transporting the minors for unlawful sexual activity, namely child rape. Uh, and the other charges were uh, structuring money to evade reporting requirements, which is when, when you send less than $10,000, so uh, the money isn't reported. Uh, meanwhile, the case that the Nawabians like to ignore is the state case. Uh, in which York pled guilty to 77 counts of aggravated child molestation and other things. And for that one, he's serving 50 years in prison. So let's keep in mind, the, these you, you serve uh, federal and state uh, jail time at the same time. So it's 50, he does 50 years for the state stuff and 135 years at the same time for the federal stuff. So let's assume that these guys get their way and President Obama forgives him for the federal charges. He still has to do jail time for the state charges. And those state charges, quote unquote, aggravated child molestation, are not nonviolent offenses. Now, the key thing that I want to focus on this uh, video is how do we know that he actually raped those children? Now, first, some caveats. Uh, because this case involves uh, child victims, uh, the Nawabians do have one advantage. That is the uh, Child Victims and Child Witnesses uh, Rights Act, which means that all these documents and all these criminal uh, procedures are under seal. Uh, the amount of information that can be obtained publicly about this case is limited to what is not uh, sealed, which is limited, and what is what was reported in the news. And this is something that Nuwabians have been using for propaganda purposes uh, because they, they can get away with arguing, oh, well, it's all sealed because it was a conspiracy. No, it's not a conspiracy. It's that the victims were minors, uh, nine years old, uh, that kind of, that under 18. And therefore, their, their information has, uh, by federal law, has to be protected. That being said, uh, I've copied this diagram, which is, is actually from a geology uh, textbook, uh, to introduce a concept that I'm going to be using in this video. And that, that is convergence of evidence. That is, if we have multiple pieces of evidence that we can obtain uh, publicly, and they all point to one direction, we can reach a very... Uh, strong conclusion of uh, what the truth is. And in this case, we have multiple pieces of independently ver verifiable information that points to the fact that Dwight York was guilty of child molestation, child rape. 
Uh, the first data point is the easiest one to discuss because it's the most obvious one. Number one, York admitted to these crimes. He entered guilty pleas stating that he raped multiple children in state and federal court. And although Nuwabians like to ignore this fact, uh, York was not the only one that was accused of these things. Uh, three of his wives, uh, let, let me emphasize that, three of his wives, plural, uh, were also charged uh, with uh, child molestation. Uh, the only one whose uh, court uh, result I was able to find is Kathy Johnson, who entered a guilty plea uh, to the child molestation charges uh, she, that she knew about it and did not report it, report it to the authorities. So not only did uh, York admit to it, but his main wife admitted to doing these things. Now, the other thing about the guilty plea, which addresses the issue of physical evidence, is the timing of the guilty plea, as has been pointed out by NuwapianFacts.com, uh, which I went ahead and verified. Uh, Malachi York did not enter the guilty plea until after, uh, what was this? This was July 29th, when he was he was ordered to take uh, STD tests for herpes viruses simplex 1 and 2. When the results for those tests came back positive, he entered guilty pleas in January 23rd. Now, at least in the federal case, uh, he did actually uh, withdraw that guilty plea, just to point that out. But he did not uh, withdraw that plea until nine months later. And let's keep in mind that he was uh, found guilty by a jury of his peers, even though he withdrew the guilty plea. Now, there's two things that needs to be discussed about the uh, herpes test. Uh, as uh, Richard Moultrie, which was a federal, federal prosecutor, pointed out, uh, the victims also had herpes. So, although this is not 100% evidence that he did rape those children, we have a very strong coincidence here in that uh, the alleged rapist had uh, herpes and the victims also had herpes. Now, one of the things that uh, Nuwabians like to point out is that uh, Dwight York did not have chlamydia, while some of the victims did have chlamydia. Now, as was explained by uh, Moultrie and can be easily ver verified just by looking up uh, any, any website that discusses chlamydia. Chlamydia is an easily treatable disease, which means that uh, the fact that Dwight York did not have chlamydia does not mean that he did not have sex with those children. It simply means that uh, the possibility exists that he either infected those, he, that he infected those kids with chlamydia and then treated himself and left the kids untreated. Uh, now, a second thing that needs to be also discussed here is that uh, this guy was a religiously religious leader, uh, supposedly a holy man, yet he has uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And by the same token, we have a situation in which children are infected with sexually transmitted diseases. So even if we assume that York did not rape those children, Somebody must have because they have, uh, what's it called, uh, herpes. Now, just for some more detail, uh, we're going to go to the reply brief, uh, which uh, Dwight York's uh, attorney, Adrian Patrick, filed in January 14th, uh, 2005, uh, to appeal his conviction. Now, as he argues in uh, page uh, 7, he argues that... Uh, the government tried to combine RICO charges for structuring money with four counts of interstate transfers of uh, transport of minors for unlawful sexual activity. Now, notice what the argument here is. He argues that if it were not for the RICO charges, because of the fact that the crimes occurred between 1988 through 1994, the statute of limitations would have expired. In other words, Adrian Patrick, Dwight York's attorney, admits that he did do these things. His argument is that because it occurred after the statute of limitation, the appeal should be overturned. Uh, the conviction should be overturned. 
Now, this gets even more ridiculous in uh, section 5, in which he argues that, quote, uh, in order for him to be convicted, they need to prove that the sexual activity was unlawful. In other words, uh, Adrian Patrick here is conceding that uh, York did uh, have sex with these children, but he's arguing that it was not unlawful. Uh, and as we can see here, um, uh, where was it? Uh, at the uh, the bottom of uh, page 12, which for some reason is page 17 for, on my end, uh, uh, quote, the only evidence presented to the jury was that there was sexual activity. That's it. Sexual activity in and of itself is not a crime. Georgia law was necessary and was not presented. <laughs> uh, in other words, yes, uh, Adrian Patrick does concede that medical, physical evidence of sexual activity with, with minors was presented in court. The, what he's arguing in his appellate brief uh, or appellate reply is that there was no evidence that sexual activity was unlawful because the, the Georgia state law was not provide, provided in court. And if we keep going down, he also argues uh, intent. He, he concedes that children were moved across state lines, uh, but he argues that the purpose of the travel was not to have sex with the children. <laughs> Now, going back to the medical evidence uh, issue, uh, one of the arguments made by Dwell Malachi York and uh, New Wabians is that uh, the victims did not have the right type of scars. Uh, according to them, if there was actual sexual penetration, the children should have developed keloid scars because according to them, African-American children uh, only develop keloid scars. Now, I was able to find a uh, study which discusses this uh, and it states that African Americans only develop keloid scars in 16% of uh, cases of surgery, uh, of specific type of surgery, uh, which means that, in other words, uh, no, uh, uh, African Americans do not always develop keloid scars. They can also scar normally, or they could not experience scarring at all. Uh, in other words, no, the lack of keloid scars does not prove that uh, Malachi York did not uh, do these things. Um, I was yes, I was 17 years old, and yes, I did agree to having a child with his father at that age. I understood my age. I understood his age. Um, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I consented to it. So I told Jacob that that's the way that I felt. I now I just wanted to discuss this for Catman because it's something that New Orleans always bring up. Now, they're completely right. In Georgia, the age of consent is 16 years old. So, assuming that she's telling the truth, and she did have a child with uh, Malachi York at age 17, that was completely legal. But going back to the convergence of evidence thing, if we put this into the larger story, this does not make uh, Malachi York look good, and actually makes York uh, look guilty. Uh, first of all, York at the time was 60 years old. Uh, so for him to be having children with a 17-year-old woman doesn't look good, particularly when he's the head of a supposedly religious organization. Uh, it, meanwhile, if we put this again into context, we know from reports that at the time he had four other wives which if we add Habiba to the uh, equation, it means he had five women that he was impregnating that we know of uh, on record. So this was a sexual, <laughs> a 60 year old man uh, with a voracious sexual appetite getting a bunch of barely legal girls uh, pregnant. Women are the goddesses. Right. If you put them in the right position, they rule. People always talk about, you ever see Malachi, you ever see he's walking with a bunch of women, he's walking with his daughter, he's walking with his wife. I got women around me, you know why? Now, that might be a minor point, but I wanted to bring it up because there's a lot of comments that Malachi York makes in all of his videos that bring up red flags. Uh, there's comments uh, such as that one where he's saying that he's always uh, surrounded by young women. Uh, there's comments uh, he makes that uh, African-American children uh, reach sex sexual maturity at a younger age. Uh, there's comments he makes about um, having multiple wives, uh, how that's allowed, that all that kind of stuff. Uh, and finally, one final point, uh, because this video is getting kind of long. 
Uh, the final point of evidence that I'm going to point to uh, in this video is that in 1964, Dwight York was uh, convicted of rape, uh, of the rape of a 13-year-old girl. So it, he already had a history of sexual assault uh, towards uh, minors. So uh, just to recap the video, we have all these independent data points that all point to the fact that this guy is a bad guy. We have him uh, convicted of rape in 1964. We have him uh, becoming the leader of a weird religious cult, which is not normal behavior. Uh, we have him with multiple wives, multiple underaged wives, which is, again, uh, not normal behavior. We have all these different accusations of different people uh, stating that they were sexually assaulted by him. We have positive medical results showing that he had the same sexual diseases as the victims in this case. And we have him and his wives pleading guilty, confessing to raping multiple children. All these things individually might not be very good evidence, but if you put it all together, we have a very clear picture of the fact that this guy is guilty and deserves to be in jail.